These actual ejection shots set the stage for our program about a piece of equipment you may have to depend upon someday to save your very life. Sound dramatic? It's intended to. Like most things in the aviation business, the proper operation of your ejection seat takes some know-how. Before you can count on it, you have to know what it can and can't do. You are also going to have to know how to thoroughly pre-flight the seat and operate it in all modes. Let's start off by taking an overall look at the seats themselves. The four ejection seats are independent escape systems connected to a command ejection system that in ICAP-2 aircraft allows the pilot to eject all occupants. In Block 86 aircraft, this same feature has been added to ECMO-1 seat and is selected by placing this handle to the both position. The two aft ECMO seats can be individually activated in either model. By the way, the seats aren't connected to the canopy either. Because of that, the seats are designed to let you eject through the canopy under all flight conditions. Or if you're below 250 knots and have the time, you can jettison the canopies before you eject. The GRU-7 is rated as a zero-zero seat. Essentially, that means you can eject while at ground level and not moving, and still get a good shoot every time. There are two ejection handles that are used to initiate ejection. The upper handle, or face curtain, activates the automatic ejection sequence whenever it is pulled out seven inches. What you're really doing is pulling this sear from the primary explosive charge in the catapult, actuating the gun to fire. The same thing happens if the lower handle is pulled out two inches. The handles are the only two controls that fire the main cartridge on the gun of the seat. Because of their capability, both handles have locking devices to keep the seat safe from firing when you don't want it to. Both guards are simple to operate. The upper guard is this small latch. The handle is safe when the latch is up. To arm the seat, push the latch down. The lower handle has a rotating guard that is positioned right in front of the handle loop when safe. To arm the lower handle, just rotate the guard down and toward your left knee. Speaking of ejection handles, both the upper and lower handles of the pilot's seat are connected to a special tube and set of initiators we mentioned before, called the Command Ejection System. In Block 86, ECMO-1 can also initiate command ejection. If the pilot pulls either handle, all four seats are ejected from the plane in a timed sequence. ECMO number three is ejected immediately after the pilot pulls the handle. ECMO number two, 0.4 seconds later. ECMO number one, 0.8 seconds later. And the pilot leaves 1.2 seconds after initiating ejection. These delays are present during command or individual ejection. But remember, we're talking about the pilot seat and in Block 86 aircraft, ECMO one seat. The automatic command system can't be initiated by the handles on any of the other seats. One other thing the pilot seat does that the other seats can't is tilt back and forth. All seats have height adjustment and there are time limits on their usage. The duty cycle for the seat motors is 30 seconds on, 10 minutes off. Seat tilt has no effect on ejection, but head and neck injury may occur if the seat height allows your helmet to project above the face curtain during ejection. The shoulder harness restraint control is used to lock the upper body into position for carrier landings. The system also will physically pull you back into the seat when the ejection sequence starts. The inertia reel works somewhat like seat belts in a car to stop forward motion if enough forward velocity is felt. Moving down the front of the seat, we come to the only new seat man connection you may not be familiar with, the leg restraint cords. These small bayonet fittings connect to your leg garters. The leg garters are a good example of how to take something simple and make it complicated. First of all, they're not identical. The buckles for the straps should be on the inside of your legs. This gives you a good fabric lock against a backward pull. Your leg garters should look like this when they're on. Once hooked up, these cords pull your legs back against the seat as it goes up the rails to make sure your legs don't flail around. This little tab next to each cord allows you to adjust the length of the restraint cord. Your G-suit and oxygen hose attached to the same type of personnel services quick disconnect that you used in the T2 and A4. 
This gauge on the RSSK7 seat pan is connected to the emergency oxygen bottle inside the pan. It supplies approximately 15 minutes worth of oxygen to you when you eject or if you pull this green ring. 15 minutes equates to about 1800 PSI. The rectangular handle shown here is used to release the seat pan. There is another handle just like it on the other side, and either handle will release the pan during a descent. The single yellow handle shown here is for the newer style seat pan, the SKU-2. On the upper left-hand section of the seat, you'll find a whole nest of tubes, rods, lines, and connectors. Let's look at what they do. This strap is your parachute withdrawal line. It connects the 28-foot flat canopy personnel chute to the controller and stabilizer drogue chutes which are stowed behind the headrest. These two smaller chutes are used to stabilize the seat during freefall. This black barrel is the drogue gun. Inside the barrel is a solid metal piston packed onto an explosive charge. Right after the seat fires, so does the drogue gun deploying the controller drogue chute. The drogue chute lines and your parachute withdrawal line all meet up here at the top of the seat and attach to a connection called the scissors shackle. The scissors shackle secures both the controller and stabilizer drogues to the seat after they've deployed, but it prevents the personnel chute from being pulled out. The scissors shackle is released for main chute deployment when a barostat and time relief mechanism on the top right side of the seat senses that you're low enough to start making your parachute descent. The time release mechanism is actuated by this trip rod at the moment of ejection. If you and your seat are below 13,000 feet, plus or minus 1,500 feet, the barostat allows the time release mechanism to count off a two-second delay to let the seat slow down. When the timer runs out, the mechanism then immediately opens the scissor shackle to allow the main chute to deploy. The last control on the seat itself that we want to explore is the emergency restraint release handle. You use this handle when you want to get out of the seat in a hurry. By pulling the handle like this, the parachute withdrawal line guillotine is actuated. This cutting action separates your main chute from the scissors shackle and the drogues. It also releases from the seat your shoulder harness, lap belt harness locks, personnel parachute container retention fittings, the survival kit, and the leg restraints. The two situations in which you would most likely need to release yourself from the seat are one, if for any reason after you've ejected you need to get away from your seat in a hurry, or two, on the ground during an emergency egress that doesn't require you to eject. When you pull the handle, your face curtain and lower ejection handles will be locked, but don't think you are safe from ejection. The command ejection system can still eject your seat. You are now separated from the seat with your parachute pack and seat pan firmly attached to your torso harness. Remember, if you pull this handle, manually separate yourself from the seat during descent. It's going to be up to you to deploy your chute by pulling the parachute ripcord down and across your body. Once you cut yourself loose, chute deployment isn't automatic. You must pull the ripcord. Now that we have covered the seat and its controls, let's go out and pre-flight the seat and strap in. The first thing to check is proper installation of the ejection seat safety pins. Let's look at them by the numbers. Pin number one is the emergency restraint release safety pin. We just talked about what happens when this handle is pulled. Pin number two goes to the lower ejection safety guard. While installed, the guard will not move out of safe. The third pin safes the upper ejection handle. Pin number four is inserted in the rocket motor initiator on the left side of the headrest. This long pin with the bend at the bottom safes the sear for your powered harness retraction unit. The sixth pin is the main ejection gun here on the top of the seat. Pin number seven is the drogue gun safety pin. It's inserted just aft and below the rocket motor initiator cover. Pin number eight is installed only on the pilot seat, except for Block 86 aircraft where ECMO-1 has one also. It saves the gas sequence generator that sets off the command ejection system. During pre-flight, this pin is inspected and pulled first. 
Don't pull it until you've checked that the main ejection guns are pinned on all four seats. The actual pre-flight of your seat starts by first checking that the face curtain lock is in the up or safe position. Then look through the little windows on the side to check the connections between the face curtain and the firing linkage. Next, check the rigging between the scissors and the drogue gun. Now pre-flight the ejection gun bracket. Check that it is lock wired and secure. Also make sure that the bracket, the gun, and the tube are the correct color for the crew position you're in. For ECMO 3, the color is white. For ECMO 2, it's orange. On ECMO number 1 seat, these items are purple. And for the pilot, look for brown as the color. Now check the ejection gun firing linkage. It should be connected to the sear. Now check that the primary firing mechanism is lock wired and sealed. On all three ECMO seats, you need to be sure the gas line tubing is connected to the sequenced firing gas generator piston. Next, check the top latch mechanism that secures the seat to the rails. The plunger should be flush with or slightly recessed from the sleeve that's around it. Just aft of the guillotine clip, you'll see a screw connector on the parachute withdrawal line. It should be finger tight with no gap between the knurled halves. Check the parachute withdrawal line up above the fairing and make sure that it's routed through the yellow clip of the guillotine. You can pull the clip open to make sure that the line hasn't been severed. That tells you whether or not the emergency restraint release handle has accidentally been pulled. Just below the drogue gun and the protective fairing is the connecting link for the inertia reel and the powered harness retraction sear. The connection should look like this. Then check that the rocket motor firing link is attached to the sear like this. Now move over and look at the left side of the headrest. Check to be sure that the static line for the rocket motor initiator is connected to the sear on one end and the drogue gun trip rod on the other. Also check that the drogue gun shear pin is in place and an O stamp appears on the pin. No O means no go. Behind the seat, you'll see two yellow trip rods attached to a fixed bracket on the lower end. The one on the left goes to the drogue gun. The one on the right goes to the time release mechanism. Make sure they're both attached at each end and there's no red showing under the trip rod outer barrels. Now lock the shoulder harness with the locking lever and pull hard on the inertial reel straps. They shouldn't move at all. Check your coke fittings for easy operation and the condition of the seawars, and while you're there, give the parachute pack a good pull to be sure it's securely attached. Open the snaps to the parachute and check that the three release pins are not bent and the D-ring cable is connected. Then check security of the survival kit by pulling up on the lap belts. On Block 86 aircraft, check the command eject control handle. Be sure that it's in position according to your brief. On the left side of the seat, check that the disconnect lanyard for the personnel services block is secured to the deck and the emergency oxygen lanyard is attached to the personnel services block. Next, give the leg lines a pull to be sure they're locked to the seat. The lower ejection handle guard should be up in the locked position like this with the pin in place behind it. Then move forward on the same side of the seat bucket to the survival kit front lock release lever. Make sure the lever is in the full forward position and that the survival kit is locked in position. You may have to raise the seat a little to do this. Remember, if this lever isn't in the full forward position, you can't eject with the lower handle because the handle will be mechanically locked. Check the lanyard for your survival radio beacon for proper routing and attachment. It should look like this. Then be sure the emergency restraint release handle is stowed. Remember we talked earlier about how important that handle is. Check the black tube that functions as the initiator for the withdrawal line guillotine. Make sure that it's lock wired and sealed and that the sear is in place. Remember there are two types of seat pans. Lift up the seat cushion here and check the emergency oxygen gauge on the SKU-2. Or look at the aft right side of the seat on the RSSK-7. The gauge should read 1800 PSI. Okay, only a few checks more. 
Be sure the time release mechanism trip rod is secured here and that the housing is lock wired and sealed. There should be an adapter ring behind the aneroid cap too. The last pre-flight check is for the pilot seat on all aircraft and ECMO-1 seat on Block 86 models. Check the sequenced firing gas generator sear extraction rod. It should be connected to the gas generator sear and the seat firing linkage. Okay, your pre-flight is over except for pulling the safety pins and a check of the cockpit deck for FOD. But before we pull the pins, here's some motherhood about ejection seat pre-flight discrepancies. There are no upper one-time flight discrepancies. If your seat isn't right, the airplane is down. No ifs, ands, or buts. Don't ever snivel this rule. Ignoring it could kill you. Remember, if your seat isn't right, the aircraft is down. Now let's pull the pins. Although you can pull the pins any way you want, the order specified here is designed to cut down your exposure to accidental ejection or actuation of any of the explosive devices in the seat. If you're ready, let's pull the pins in the recommended order. Remember, the command eject pin on the pilot's and in Block 86 aircraft ECMO-1 seat must be pulled before any others on any seat. Only then can you pull the pins on the other seats. First, remove the emergency restraint release pin. Then, remove the lower ejection handle pin. Next, remove the pin from the drogue gun. Then, remove the long harness retraction pin. The next step is to remove the rocket initiator pin. Pin number six is for the ejection gun. It's on top of the seat. The way to reach it is to approach it from the outboard side. You might have to feel around a bit, but if you follow the flags, you should find it with no problem. Finally, follow the connecting flag up to the face curtain and remove the pin from the safety latch. When you're all done, fold the pins and insert them in the map case next to your seat. Okay, it's time to sit down, strap in, and try not to step on the seat if possible. Begin your hookup with the leg restraints because they can sometimes be hard to reach. Plug in your oxygen mask and G-suit over here on the left side. The G-suit connection can really be a pain if you wait until you're completely strapped in before you hook it up. Next, attach the lower coke fittings to your torso harness and tighten the straps by pulling hard. It sometimes helps to pull your body up and squirm around a little to take the slack out of the lap belts. Do it again after taxiing for takeoff, and then one more time just prior to takeoff. You want to be able to have full stick authority and be able to reach the spin assist switch. Finally, unlock the shoulder harness and attach the outboard fitting. You'll want to connect the inboard shoulder last in case you get stuck and need some help from your buddy in the next seat. Now pick up your mask. Turn on the oxygen and click your ICS a couple of times with the mask facing away from you. Why? Because it's a lot more comfortable to detect sparks in your mask before you put it on. This concludes the presentation on the ejection seat. Review your student guide and when ready, ask the Learning Center instructor for the ejection system test.